Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Well, hello everyone. This is Rob from RV Talk Radio. This is episode 102. Really nice to have you. And uh, I know we're not getting our episodes out as fast as we used to. <laughs> Been a little swamped. Uh, don't forget, uh, you can always hear the show on Good Talk Radio, which is a full-time radio show. Uh, we play, I believe, RV Talk Radio three times during the day. Uh, so if you want to catch some episodes, and we always get the latest episodes up there too, uh, feel free to uh, go to goodtalkradio.com. And uh, you can program us in your phone, and you can catch all the other great shows there, too. So, yeah, my question today is, are full-time RVers homeless people? And uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but uh, I do want to cover some other issues. Well, not issues, but other uh, subjects, and, uh, and uh, blend that in there. So, yeah. So I got to confess, the last episode was uh, interesting. We brought up some sensitive subjects, and I thought I was going to get terrorized by comments and all kinds of stuff, and you guys fooled me. <laughs> it did it again. Actually, the feedback was very positive. There was only one or two, like, rawr, 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 rawr. but others, you know, you saw the sensibility into some of the things we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, some of the stuff about just go out there, be a full-time RVer. Boy, that's the thing to do. And uh, once again, I go out there and I watch these videos of these young f folks out there. It's like, oh, how to prepare to live in the desert at Courtside. And it's like, uh, there's no bathrooms. There's no water. There's no nothing. <laughs> but you get to go out and be sociable. <laughs> so, um, So the question is, Okay, so you're homeless and you want us to join you. And uh, that's kind of what the subject today is, is about uh, uh, defining that out a little bit. But yeah, and of course there's the other ones of like how to stay in the BLM land and get away with, uh, you know, bending the rules a little bit and, you know, not you know, stay in the 14 days and all that stuff. And it's like, really, is that really how you want to live, people? <laughs> So anyway, uh, however, let's get back to the other side. RVing is awesome. I full-timed two times. I did it in 2006 and I also did it in 2015. Enjoyed it very much. However, um, every time I stepped in the RV, the first question I asked myself is, is this the best I could do to provide for Sherry, my wife? Um, and my pets and stuff and uh, so you know that was something I, I dealt with all the time and as much as I enjoyed it and I, enjoy, and I have a really good RV or fifth wheel and uh, but at the same time it's like you know I didn't go through life to just be a gypsy I went through life to make some achievements and also look at uh, security in the future and what ifs like what happens if I died or Sherry died? What what do I got to you know show for it? And what do I have to leave for my wife or in other people's cases, your partner and stuff like that? Of of what are they going to do when you're gone? You can just leave them an RV. Um, some of them, I know my wife wouldn't be comfortable toting around a fifth wheel. And anyway, so to me it was like I know I can do better than this. Um, at the same time, I love my RV and I love traveling in it. And like I said in the last show, it's funny when you live in an RV, all you want to do is get out of that RV because of the cramped quarters and things like that. As soon as you get back into a home and you still have your RV, all you can think about is getting back to the RV to enjoy it. So yeah, I guess the grass is always greener kind of thing. But yeah, um, 
We'll talk more about this. So to change the subject just for a little while here, I wanted to talk about a new show we're featuring on Good Talk Radio. And if you're traveling in an RV, you may have been thinking about gold prospecting uh, as a hobby or something fun to do because you're going to all kinds of different areas. Just like uh, here in uh, Arizona, I think Wickenburg is a real popular place to go gold, gold panning and gold mining. Anyway, so we're, we have this new show. It's called uh, goldradioshow.com. And uh, they're... They do a podcast, an hour and a half podcast, talking about gold panning. So if you want to catch that show, go to Good Talk Radio on Saturdays, I believe at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock is when we show um, play that show. And it's really a good show. It's really interesting about the things they talk about and claims and different pieces of equipment and uh, some of the secret stuff about where they go. And it's kind of fun to uh, listen to. So once again... If you get a chance, go to goldradioshow.com and uh, check out their show. Or you can listen to them on our program at Good Talk Radio at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturdays. At, um, and it's an hour and a half show and just kick back. And, and by the way, on Good Talk Radio, um, the whole afternoon is devoted to outdoor activities. So... Uh, we've got a couple of things there and a couple of new things coming on I can't announce yet, but uh, we have hunting and fishing uh, on there and we also have the uh, gold show and um, uh, even RV Talk radios amongst uh, that earlier in the morning. So yeah, really, uh, I don't know, I, I, I actually own a gold pan and I keep it in the back of the truck behind the seat and I, I'm been dying to try and i'm not i want to do it just i just want to do it for the fun of it i'm i'm hoping you know, i assume a lot of people are that way and you think i've ever got that thing dirty <laughs> it just sits there just never had the chance to use it and so um i'm kind of trying to i like to hook up with these people because one's in arizona and at least maybe on a weekend just go up and, and just do some gold panning and and see how you know how weak my knees are when I'm working on the, uh, squatting down there and just realizing I'm still too fat. But uh, anyway, at the same time, it's just be kind of fun. I'd just like to see if I could actually find some and uh, you know do the pan thing correctly. And I think it'd be fun. And plus, it's just always a good excuse to get outdoors. So yeah, gold panning. Once again, uh, the Gold Radio Show. And um, yeah, it's. It's, I, I don't know, they just, I didn't take it that serious till I heard the show and I'm going, man, that just sounds like fun. By the way, uh, just so, um, if, you, if you're if you like me and can't remember anything, <laughs> I'll put a link to their website in our description and uh, you can go check them out. And I'll also put, we have links to Good Talk Radio down there too if you want to catch the show on Saturdays. So yeah, <laughs> look again, check it out. So here we go with the subject of our full-time RVers, homeless people. So and and so it all depends, I guess, on how you look at it. Uh, there's a lot of folks that full-time and then they project their residency in a state that they either are comfortable with or get the best tax benefits. And so in a way, the world, or I should say, United States recognizes them as a resident in that particular area. So then they're not actually considered homeless. Or are they? And then there is folks out there that are, in a sense, homeless, because we kind of discovered that a lot, especially with the caravan kind of folks or van dwellers, where that is their only means of making a... a making a decent life out of a fixed income that may be really actually too low to handle an apartment or a house or a, uh, or renting a house or anything like that. They find that an RV is within their budget and um, maybe they only make $1,000 a month from fixed income or something, plus or minus. And, uh, you know, what do you do for food and clothing and, and medical and things like that? Uh, so living in a... Uh, 
like a van or a low cost trailer or something like that uh, can really make sense to keep the overhead down. So then, of course, the question comes up is, are they homeless? Um, you know, it's in, in a lot of cases, I guess they kind of are. So, you know, when they do these statistics of homeless people, are they actually capturing the people off the grid? Or, or, or I guess I would say they're off the grid in a sense, even if they used an RV park or something. But, um, you know, how many people are out there that have had issues or medical issues or can't work anymore or disabilities that because of low income, they found the RV lifestyle to be an affordable way to have a roof over their heads and still be able to eat eat and buy clothing and and have a life you know socialize and you know, I mean everybody deserves that so uh, you know uh, of course then there's these guys that are full timing and I did it too where you know we sold our house and everything and went full timing would that make me homeless um, in a way I guess that it that did and I think that's one of the things that bothered me a lot when we we're full timing is like you know I don't mind disconnecting from society a little bit, but the goals in life are to kind of, you know, the American dream a little bit. And so it it bothered me the fact that, you know, is this all I have to show for my whole life? Is this RV? Um, at the same time, you know, you got rid of all that responsibility and, uh, you know, enjoying life. Um, and in a you know a smaller unit type of thing and and so i find a lot of people that get older in age there's certain things that they like to do that's a slow pace like gardening and taking care of a yard and relaxing in a yard or having a place for their pets where they can be you know not on a leash all the time and they have their own backyard and things like that so boy that's hard to balance all that is is that stress or not you know, they say owning things is stress. And the less you own, the less stress you have. Well, that can be a true statement. But at the same time, some people like to go through life with responsibilities. And and that's good, too. And, and society today is like, uh, it's all about me type thing. And live for the now. And it's like, gosh, if we all think, you know, started thinking like that, we wouldn't have a very, you know, um, productive country at all and we wouldn't have very good doctors and we wouldn't have uh, a great architecture and all these things of uh, people that are out working hard and achieving things and getting degrees and then becoming experts in their field and uh, then we got these ones is like live through the now and be a gypsy and break away from reality and it's like what do you, you know <laughs> what do you embrace uh, I don't know. I, I I know that I sure neck didn't teach my kids to be gypsies and live for the now. I taught them to be hard workers and achieve things, and and they have, and and they got great families, and they can uh, they can uh, provide for them almost anything they want as far as uh, schools and the things they need for school and education and friends and toys and and uh, outings and things like that. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I really have a hard time with these shows that are saying, come on here, this is the way to go. In fact, I got a comment. <laughs> I did get one kind of negative comment. It goes, well, you didn't paint a very good picture about full-timing. Well, that was the point. <laughs> It's like we can't have all the shows out here, RV shows, podcasts, videos, all works, saying this wonderful lifestyle and not telling the whole story. And that's why people watch these videos and listen to these podcasts to help make their decisions whether to come out here, if it's for them or not. And so, uh, I'm, I mean, I remember when I was working and I and I was in an aerospace company and I told people, yeah, as soon as I retire, me and Sherry are going to go take off on the RV. And they kind of like, the looks on their faces, like, are you nuts? And then others go, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should do it. But the more they research it, the more they go, 
nah, it's not for us. Uh, sounds wonderful, but the big picture? Ugh, I don't know. So, but I'm used to being around career people. And maybe that's my fault. Um, but I know a lot of people that... Uh, well, I don't want to say blue collar isn't a career. There's some great skills out there and stuff too. But uh, I was always among kind of white collar folks and stuff. And you know, everybody is always trying to achieve things. And, and very rare do you find that many people that want to regress in that. It's like I work too hard to just have nothing at the end. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, getting back to the, the subject of are you homeless? <laughs> well... In a way, you are. I mean, uh, uh, I when I was RVing full time, I don't know how many times I go. God, everything around me is not mine. Uh, I was, you know, I financed my RV because we bought a new one, um, and it's like now everything around me, I can't even really. I can say these are mine. This RV is mine, even though I'm making a payment on it. Um, now my vehicles, I own them outright, but. Still, I guess kind of point like I didn't go through life not to be able to say something's mine. Um, in the United States, we're so fortunate to be able to buy property and buy homes. In a lot of countries, you're just allowed to use their land or you lease land and stuff and you don't really own it. And that's why some of the farmers and all that stuff are so messed up in these other countries because these other countries literally don't let you own property and let you thrive in capitalism and so uh it's kind of sad uh, i've been there's a new uh series out by the way when it comes to uh well it comes more to it's called rotten r-o-t-t-e-n and uh oh and one of the uh, anyway so it's on netflix and it talks about our food and how we you know sustainability and things like that uh, if you get a chance, it's a new series that come out, really educates you about our messed up system. I mean, like capitalism is good to a point, but then there's always that greedy folks up there, the corporations and people trying to control things. And you wonder, these people make millions of dollars and they're so greedy to get more. And it's like it's a lot of us are going, gosh, if I just had a million... <laughs> Just give it to me once to kind of like get, uh, I don't know, It's it, the greed is something fierce. But uh, comparing what we do here in the United States compared to other countries, uh, we're very fortunate in a lot of areas, uh, and yet we don't seem to appreciate it. And so owning something and having something your own, you know, like your house or something like that, uh, is a good thing. And then there's the fact of, having your own space to do the things you want to do in it. If you have a house, I mean, you can't do, you know, I can't put a chicken coop in the back of my yard, not where I live. I did, you know, I could buy a place that would allow me to do that. I can't just do anything I want, but I didn't, uh, I bought a house that provides me the things that I want to do, like have a backyard and maybe have a little garden and a, and a place to relax and have company. Uh, and that makes me happy. If I want to have a horse or I want to have some cattle or something like that, I would have bought a different kind of land so I could do those things. So some people, many people go, I get so tired of what people tell me I can and can't do. Well, then you move to a place that provides you the things that you want to do. And that's the same thing with RVing, I guess, too. But yeah, so you full timers, are you homeless? Are you homeless people? <laughs> How do you feel about that? Tell me, do you feel like you're homeless or do you just feel like, eh, I'm just enjoying life? So I was reading an article the other day, I think it was in 50, RV years, 50 and older um, uh, article, a guy, uh, is part of Thousand Trails, right? And he's got a, actually a pretty good sized uh, motorhome. And he called ahead. They said, yep, we have a space for you. And he showed up. And it was like, 
the backyard kind of little sp spot that was just kind of for overflow because they said they only had one spot left where he actually couldn't even really fit in and uh anyway he was very ticked off and uh it sounded like he actually it didn't even work for his rig i mean he's like why did i even tell you the size of my rig and stuff if you're not going to listen to me and uh so I, I i got the impression that they didn't stay and they went to walmart overnight and uh but was very uh upset about that scenario and and I, you know, we're part of Thousand Trails too, and uh, we're actually pretty fortunate. We never had any mishaps, uh, but every one of them was different. I mean, uh, over in the Northwest, uh, if you go along the coast, you know, you kind of go to those parks there, and they're kind of this kind of shat, you know, shoddy kind of. They're okay, and they work. Uh, some of them I was in, it was like raining a lot and over in Long Beach and it was like a mud hole all the time. But, uh, and then I went to another one at Seaside and it was beautiful. Oh my God. It was really nice. Really liked it. And we we're treated very professional actually at all of them. But, uh, I have heard several times when things really get busy, uh, it's really hard to get in them. And of course, if you get the ones that are popular and you hit it, try to get into them, during the main season, like we tried to get into uh, Copperfield or some, uh, over in Arizona uh, as we we're coming down here, and they're booked for months. And it's like, ah, uh, you can't be spontaneous with some of those. Um, but uh, be careful of the overflow. If there's like, yeah, we have one or two spots for overnighters, you could end up in a real, because uh, they're getting, you know, they're greedy. They just want to fill everything and make their money. And they'll stick you in spots and you're like, ugh. And it's okay if they gave you the heads up first saying, it's not the best spot in the world. It works well for overnight. It has all the hookups, but it's not one of our best. Do you mind using that? Uh, or maybe they'll knock off. Well, you, in Thousand Trails, you could do this thing for $3 a night. Anyway, it's a interesting deal. But I'd sure love to hear your stories. The things that have happened to you with not only Thousand Trails, but some of the other ones, uh, the KOAs, the KM Resorts, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, I'm really leery of a lot of them. I was not too upset with Thousand Trails. I thought that wasn't didn't turn out too bad for us. I uh, did get a little concerned about what they called KM Resorts back in 2006, which now they call themselves something else. But... Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, of course, there's the, uh, there's the uh, uh, American Passport and some others out there uh, that are... I'd just be curious to hear some of the stories of good... You know, If you've always had success with certain ones, we'd like to hear about it, and I'll make sure and talk about it on the show to tell others. And if there's some that have just really let you down, like American Passport... Uh, I, we really tried to use that when we could, but if you really look at their discounts and stuff, they're always on oddball days, like Wednesday, Thursdays. And if you don't hit them, you can't get 50% off. Um, they're uh, hardest ones to use, I felt. And uh, like I said, with Thousand Trails, it was like planning ahead, but in some cases way ahead in order to just get into some of them that are in the more popular areas. So, uh, yeah, pass that along. I'd love to hear uh, more of your stories of, of RV park memberships, the pros and cons. So I was watching the Average Camper's Adventure in one of their videos of like, why did we do this? And they were, their story was real similar to me and Sherry's where they just wanted to kind of change the pace. And one of the descriptions they said was like, well, you work nine to five. You always want to kind of reward yourself with things. So you buy something and then you work some more and then you buy something and work some more. And uh, I could certainly relate to that. And I think I have to be grateful for the fact that Sherry and I did do full timing. So we did sell our house and we uh, 
kept only a handful of things in storage and we hit the road. And so we learned that lesson about minimalism of uh, reducing all that stuff. And uh, I don't know, it's, I think it's a uh, mindset type of thing is I don't, I mean, minimalism, I, I'm, I'm, I support, but at the same time I don't, but now sometimes you need to learn a lesson in it to understand what's, you know, what you should and shouldn't have. And so now that we have full time and we learn to live a minimalist life, and then we got back into a home, um, we're not finding ourselves buying a lot of stuff. Um, we have been creating more stuff, uh, doing a lot more art and stuff like that. But I mean, of course, when we got in a house, we had to get a lot of essentials for the house. But I've found if I compare my lifestyle in a house before we did full timing and look at the lifestyle now of living in a house after full timing, um, I find Sherry and I both analyze a lot of things we buy of will we use this is it a uh, I shouldn't say investment but by uh, is it a value to us and will we use it again um, what's nice with a house is we have room to have something to think a little more long term uh, where a lot of, a lot of people say well if I uh, if you're minimalist or in an RV it's like well I like to get this but we'll have to get rid of that and uh, I find that same philosophy works with a household now uh it's kind of hard to project with us a little bit because we also have a business obviously you've heard about cutting edge ra uh, radio network so we buy a lot of equipment uh lately uh, which i could have never bought if i was in an rv now i do use the same podcasting microphone and setup i had in the rv which took up our dining room table something first. My wife was like, I'm never going to see our dining room table because I've always got a laptop or something on it. Well, we don't have that problem anymore. But I do find this, uh, two big problems we have is, well, uh, the good problem is, is when we purchase things now, there's a lot of thought behind it, more so than we used to do before full timing. The other problem we found is, okay, so we pulled everything out of storage which we were living without just fine and didn't miss it. And now I've got it all here and we still sitting there and it's like, and, but now I've lost space. I don't have a garage anymore because it's nothing but boxes and stuff that we ha pulled out of storage and finding the time to go and say, we need to get rid of this stuff. It's like, obviously we don't miss it. And of course there's a lot of things that, need to go to our kids and stuff like that. And I guess I'm just going to have to put them in a box and go to my kids and say, these are yours now. <laughs> and and uh, I'm sure they'll appreciate that. Uh, I think my father did the same thing to me. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. Uh, so uh, I enjoyed their comment of uh, the fact that they, uh, uh, that people tend to get in that mode. And I believe Sherry and I lived in that mode too, where you just work and you felt like you needed to buy something to make sure you feel like you're accomplishing something and you just keep that cycle of working nine to five buying more stuff working nine to five buying more stuff as i uh, completed watching the, this video from uh, the uh, average camper adventures um, apparently they're kind of new to the transition one of the comments they said well they've watched a lot of videos of all the fun and all that stuff but they did appreciate of the things that could happen and have happened to some of these people. And so that, and I, sometimes I feel that that's lacking in a lot of the shows out there is the realism of the problems. Like when, you know, we were talking about these people that show up at RV parks and uh, parks terrible. And, and, uh, and I've been, in fact, I know I, uh, I remember just last year we were taking the RV up to central Oregon and we stopped at F Fallon and we stayed at a place I know that allows you to park your RV there. And I felt like I was in the ghetto 
And it was one of those nights where I didn't really sleep that well because I was surrounded by, and I, I'll say ghetto RVs. Um, they were junky and have been there for a long time. You know, they haven't been paying much. We had one that was in a little class C and had all kinds of stuff underneath it and around it. And it was really run down looking. And they had a newborn or at least a very young baby. Um, and I mean, babies are babies. And so we're reasonable in that kind of area. But it was a lot of screaming and yelling, you know, upset, you know, crying baby and stuff, which they do that. And that's, I can live with that. But the whole night, uh, I actually felt like I had to go out and kind of secure my RV and make sure I was safe. Uh, it didn't feel safe. It didn't feel uh, clean and it didn't feel like it was secure at all. And that happens a lot in certain circumstances or, or stopping at a, um, a rest stop, even just to use the restroom and stuff. Sometimes uh, some of the folks there are there to prey on you. And so you want to be very careful and, and I guess the one thing I didn't like about RVing is a lot of times I felt like I put Sherry in places that I would have never as her husband tried or if I knew better, I wouldn't have put her in those scenarios. Uh, and it just happened. You drive all day and you're kind of like, you you don't really know the area and you get on your cell phone or something and then you find an RV park or a place to stay overnight and it turns out to be a real slum. And uh, you're like, I'm better than this. I, I, I don't want to put my family in this position. And yet I'm kind of like stuck. That happened a lot. And uh, I mean, over the years, I mean, you get a little better at it. Uh, but every once in a while, he's like, ugh. Did it again, kind of in an area I don't like, don't feel real comfortable. And you go, well, you, know, you can just pick up and leave. Well, it's not quite that easy. It could be like bad weather. It could be you've been driving all day already and you're exhausted and you shouldn't be driving anymore. Uh, you, it's easy to say, well, don't stay there. Well, sometimes you don't, you know, you got a 36 foot RV. You can't just park that anywhere you want. So uh, sometimes you're just plain old stuck and you just got to use the facility you ended up at. And uh, I can't pass that along enough to anybody that's a new full-timer or a new RVer. As you're traveling long distances and you get in unfamiliar areas, you know, and those who have already been exposed to it, you know as well as I do, that happens a lot. So, uh, um, and you'll get better at kind of, identifying those kind of areas and sometimes you go well I'll just take my chances but only takes one opportunity for someone to really mess with you break into your RV or uh, assault one of your your uh, your partner or something and uh, you, you know that one mistake could have been avoided uh, and sometimes it couldn't be avoided so be aware of that Oh yeah, so I uh, I forgot that the RTR is starting on the 11th, which is the day I'm recording on this particular uh, segment. And uh, so I reviewed Bob from Cheap RVing and then Nomadic Fanatic, what they're doing. And yeah, they're definitely out there in the desert. Um, looks like a lot of folks. Um, it's kind of funny, everybody describes it a little different, but... Uh, it's one of those scenarios where if you're a person that doesn't like crowds and stuff, uh, you have the option to park out farther and stuff like that. But um, make sure, I, the big thing I've definitely been getting out of the videos, make sure to get your permits. And of course, there's always those rowdy people and people drinking too much and they've had issues with that. But it's always a minority but it seems like it's a majority sometimes because um, they can cause such a ruckus but uh you know whenever you bring a group of people together you know something like that's going to happen and uh <clears throat> i don't know it's uh 
I think it could be fun, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, you, it, when you bring that many people together, it's like you just got to let your hair down a little bit, be patient, turn the other cheek, and uh, enjoy it. Seems like uh, uh, at least Bob's group with the RTR, uh, they're trying our, their hardest to enforce the BLM land, um, land rules. And basically, you know, if there's a problem that they can just contact somebody that has authority to fix the problem. And that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> but just be aware that, you know, for folks that do the RTR, that it's um, not all peaches and cream. You just got to make sure and uh, have an open mind and realize that there's going to be other folks there and a lot of you uh, guys like a little more privacy and stuff you need to let your hair down a little bit i would like to remind you that you are in the desert uh, even though it's a little cooler i mean you got to look out for the critters a little bit but the big thing is your pets and even though you're out in the desert and even though is please pick up after your pets i mean i don't know why so many people do that it's like it's really irritating sometimes and it's not hard it's you get these little baggy things you put your hand in it and you, you just grab whatever it is but you don't touch it turn it inside out tie a knot and you're done and then haul it out with you when you leave with your normal garbage not that hard people so please if you're bringing pets <clears throat> please be responsible and the other thing is uh don't let them roam around too much because uh we uh we do have things here that can make your animals sick and um, be aware of that so um, let them do their thing let them walk but uh, we also have kind of a kind of a like what they call a desert fever thing that uh, the dogs can catch d uh, down here um, you know and of course we've got to be careful of rattlesnakes so keep them on a leash that's definitely the, the smart thing to do um, you know dogs are dogs and they'll get into things and eat things they shouldn't so be careful. Keep an eye on your pet. If they're acting a little diff uh, odd, make sure you get them to a vet as soon as possible. One of the big things I think people get, you know, you know, we're talking about homeless people back earlier in the show. <laughs> it's, it's a whole lot of homeless people there. And so they don't have any ownership of where they're at. And, and there's a handful of people that treat it like, well, this isn't my place. I'm going to leave my garbage out. I'm going to let my dog poop anywhere. And the biggest thing is if you're going to be a full timer or, or one of these homeless RVers, if you want to put it that way, then you're, you're looking for freedom, right? And that means that you want to be in places that, uh, that are available to the public. The problem is if you don't take care of those things, you're going to lose them and the rules will get stricter and more stricter. You know I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, it goes on all the time and you're like uh, eventually the BLM rules will change. If you, don't, if you don't take care of where you're staying and the places you go to, you're going to ruin it for everyone else that usually follows the rules to the T. It only takes out one or two percent of people to ruin it for the rest of us. So please be grateful and kind to the environment and respect these places you go to. They're you know they're public and we want them to keep them keep it that way and available to all these people that want to enjoy it. So please be a responsible at the RTR and, and anybody else that's at the court side. Uh, take care of the land. Take your garbage out, take care of your pets, and respect the land, and it'll be there for us for a long time. So, um, monitoring more shows out there. I think it was a tr driving and vibing couple there. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're at courtside. Anyway, you know, it's so funny about every single video I watch, they always have to talk about internet. And uh, and I understandably so, and so I, I want and I wanted to touch base on the one system we use and we still do on our uh, fifth wheel is Wi-Fi Ranger, and so a lot of people say, well, it's a miracle. Uh, is it a miracle kind of thing? And it's I, no, not exactly. But <clears throat> what I do like about it 
is the Wi-Fi Ranger becomes part of our network when we're in the RV. So anytime we bring our uh, wireless printer or we have a laptop and stuff, it automatically connects to the little network I created in the Wi-Fi Ranger uh, a router. And so that kind of simplifies everything as far as the RVs. And so when it comes to internet, <clears throat> sorry, um, I bring all internet in through the Wi-Fi Ranger. Uh, even if it's a hard line, I actually bring the hard line in and go into the Wi-Fi Ranger and still distribute it amongst the, the network. That makes sense. And what in the t the t a couple of times I really love the fact that I have a Wi-Fi Ranger is like uh, right now we have the RVs parked at a friend's house or a relative's house on some acreage and they have pretty good internet uh, and so but it's a ways from the house because of the Wi-Fi Ranger I can tap into their uh, uh, internet with no issue whatsoever so I don't have to like pack up my laptop and go to their house and use their internet I can get it to the RV no problem and we found that over and over and over again in all kinds of scenarios um, <clears throat> the other thing was nice is I noticed if you go to a lot of uh, uh, thousand trails they tend to have their internet at a community house type thing or clubhouse um, so <laughs> when I find that out what I usually do is trying to see if I can get a space it's fairly close to the clubhouse and I've never had a problem of how you know even if I got out of ways I can typically still tap into the internet at the clubhouse to my RV and not have to pack up my laptop and go to the clubhouse in order to see anything on the internet or in our case you know, a lot of people don't do videos but you know of course they're always looking for a, uh, a place to upload videos and and um, which is, you know, when you watch these shows, they're always talking about that because that's their livelihood to get these videos out. Uh, the typical people that are 90, 95% of just normal RVers probably appreciate the fact they don't have internet except when it comes to uh, little things like banking and email that comes in from the kids or things like that. But yeah, Wi-Fi Ranger, um, you're going to be paying. You know, we paid like $600 for the system, but to me, it was worth every penny. Uh, it didn't, uh, it's not a miracle system, and there's all these boosters and stuff, but um, it's it's just, it came in handy a lot, and it still does. Um, the other thing you'll notice is if you really have to have internet, um, most people are doing cell phone air cards or um, or hotspots on their cell phone, and <clears throat> I have yet have yet to find an affordable one. Yeah, there's kind of these things going around that you might hear about, but typically, let's say you got Sprint like we do, um, you'll go in and I think some systems you can get like 10 gigs with your plan. But typically, that's not very much. It sounds like a lot, but it's not. So you'll want to boost that up. And of course, the cell phone companies are just waiting for you to do that. So they get like 20 or 30 gigs. By the time you get something going, you're going to be spending 100 or more for 20, 30 gigs of, uh, of uh, bandwidth for your air card. And it's just not affordable it's I mean you're gonna have to do it so you have to make it affordable but I was so happy when we had to when we got into a household and we're not full-timing anymore I couldn't wait to call Sprint to cancel that oh I was so happy to quit paying and I was only getting like 30 gigs of extra space um, internet time and I used it all the time <clears throat> but um I know it was just so frustrating. So, I mean, compared like why I pay now, I pay for a business internet thing now for fifty nine dollars a month through Cox, but uh, I spent twice or three times that amount um, when I was on the road. So, just be aware that if you need that much internet, you're gonna pay for it one way or another. You're gonna pay for it. 
So I caught another video just the other day, um, Her Herbert's Travels, and he was actually walking around a salvage yard in Arizona near us um, where our RVs go to die pretty much. And uh, the one guy that was he talked to uh, said a lot of uh, high quantity of the fire, you know, and a lot of them were burnt out were started from the refrigerator where people traveling and leaving the refrigerator on and and uh, that's and and I even remember back in 2006 we actually used to keep ours on too and later on learned boy don't run those things while you're traveling shut off your gas uh, so two things that really come to mind is if you're going to be an RVer safety 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 um, especially if you're going to be homeless and that's going to be your home <laughs> you better follow procedures have lots of protection as far as fire extinguishers and stuff like that but do not travel with your propane on especially your refrigerators um, you know put some people will put like um, blue ice in their freezer and then when they leave they take the blue ice out and put it in their lower half of their RV and let it shut down and um, keep everything cooled with with that and when you get to your next place put your blue ice back up in the freezer so uh, it's better than a fire I can just tell you I know it's an inconvenience but gotta do it the other thing is come to mind some of the older RVs is take a look at your fuel lines for your propane and and, and follow them and see if they go under because I actually did run these right near the tires. And w this is another reason why you want to shut off your gas. If you blow out a tire and your fuel line happens to be going through that area, you could rupture your fuel line and start have a fire. Now, if you've got an open propane tank, you're a goner. Your, your rig's a goner. And so I've heard that a couple of times never witnessed it but I um, you might want to check that and if if anything see if you can fix it and get that fuel line not to be going through your fender area uh, because when those things I have had a blowout before and those are uh, incredibly <laughs> they can do a lot of damage and it did a lot of damage to our fifth wheel when the, we blew a tire and just imagine if I had a fuel line going through there so yeah those are a couple things I picked up out of that video other than the fact of uh, um, fire is devastating and typically rigs are just demolished they're just no good and it, it gets to a point of uh, looks like a lot of people you kind of wonder where all the RVs go when they do get damaged and stuff and of course a lot of them have tipped from rigs and from crashes and things like that and you you'll you probably don't realize just how fragile your RV is it's not a strong thing and it doesn't hold up in storms very well and tornadoes they're just they're not designed for that they're actually very um, uh, susceptible to things and you need to realize that so uh, keep in mind when you're traveling when you're pulling or if you're driving too fast if you got in an accident uh, your RV is not going to make out very well I can tell you that for sure and safety um, yes you're going to be inconvenienced especially while you're traveling but it beats the heck out of a fire and damage it's just um, and the insurance companies are not fun to deal with and if that's your house the thing you're living in and it gets damaged that kind of way you're definitely if you weren't homeless before you're going to be homeless now so we're getting towards the end of the show here but I, I think next episode I want to talk about and I've talked about it before and I'm starting to think it's actually more important than uh, I, I made it out to be is is for those of you that know us and we met and uh, you realize that I'm pretty good size guy <laughs> over the years I quit smoking and gained like 30 pounds and I was pushing the old 300 mark 
Didn't get there, but I mean, we're talking close within like two or three pounds. And I knew I had to do something. And so I watched a movie, and I've talked about this before, called What the Health. And it was talking about plant-based eating and also our environment and things like that. So I'm not going to get into the uh, that part of things other than the fact of the f- changing the way we eat. And uh, Sherry and I, we actually launched a site. It's actually called 8020vegan.com. And I still don't want to talk about the fact of becoming a vegan or a vegetarian or whatever. I think I just use the terminology plant-based diet. But what I wanted to bring up is I was pushing 297, 98. I mean, we're talking close. I am currently, and it's been six months, at 264. So I've lost over 30 pounds. And I'm not doing any. I'm not doing any extra exercise, although I should um, try to when we can. It's all because we changed to a plant-based diet. And the eighty twenty vegan. The reason we called it that is because there's exceptions to all kinds of things. Like you'll end up in situations where it's like like our daughter made breakfast and all that stuff, and it had eggs and uh, you know meat and stuff like that. And I'm not gonna deny or you know we have we can make exceptions and then as we went actually almost 100 percent vegan for quite a few months about four months and then we slowly introduced some meats back with a rule of no more than four ounces or less then sometimes you know we'll have that for one or two dinners and then kind of feel like ugh, you can kind of feel it hitting you and we'll go like meatless for a couple of days again. And so that's the mode we're in now, where it's definitely 80-20 uh, vegan, as we call it. And so last two two days, we've had nothing but plant-based type diet. And uh, we've learned to make really good food that's, you know, you can use imitation and meatballs or in meats and, and hamburgers and stuff that are actually soy and they work out great, and uh, you start you actually get a really good appreciation for vegetables, and you actually start craving them and stuff uh, more so than you ever have before. Uh, it really is kind of like smoking in a way. It's one of those things that you just gotta say you're gonna do it and uh, and quit, you know. But uh, uh, the plant-based diet one is we went 100%. I mean, we went from 100% meat and potato people to plant-based overnight and just did it hardcore. It was just like, it was, I'm not going to gradually work our way into it. We just did it. No milk, no dairy, no cheese, no meat, uh, all that stuff. And uh, it was actually a lot easier than you think. And then your first week, you can kind of like tell something's changing. And uh, uh, But when you get our age, you know, the plumbing's always kind of messing up and all that kind of stuff you'll enjoy some of the factors of feeling better as far as the digestive side of things. But naturally, I've been losing weight, and I'm not hardcore numbers, but you know, one or two pounds at the most in a week, usually just a pound, and uh, real gradual. And then when we introduced meat back a little bit, I sustained where I was. I wasn't losing anymore. I was staying there. I wasn't like going back up again. So I felt I found that to be quite interesting. And so uh, I don't know. One of the things, you know, when you get in our age and those are listening, you know, uh, how many times is, you know, you got people that are going on to diabetes or you have to take something for a high blood pressure or low blood pressure or cholesterol and all that stuff and really what you're doing is taking a medicine to block something that's a problem in the first place it doesn't make the problem go away you're just covering it up with a medication that has side effects and so up who knows what other things could happen uh, and then of course good old plaque buildup and, and stuff and I'm kind of worried about that and uh, so I thought before I get to that point where I'm like, well, you need to start taking something every day now and it's going to cost you hundreds of dollars every month. It's like, I really have learned that what we eat 
uh, has a lot to do with the way we are. <laughs> and some of the things that could happen from it's all these things that do happen tend to be from the foods we've been eating. So if I could change my food intake to constructive food that works for your body, that works good, and I'm far from an expert on any of this, maybe I won't have to worry about diabetes. Maybe I don't have to have plaque buildup. Maybe I won't have uh, uh, high blood pressure. And I don't take any medications at all right now. I do have issues with uh, diverticulitis, and but so when I changed our, my diet, I also I feel the effects of it probably more so than someone that doesn't have any issues at all, and it's been pleasant. So, if I could pass along to anybody about health or our age or things, or you're starting to realize you're you know uh, numb a little bit in your legs a little bit or stuff, or you know yet your parents have had issues. I highly urge you some way or another to educate yourself about plant-based diet. And I don't want to say the word vegan, but if you have to do a search on the internet, use the word vegan and vegetarian and plant-based diet to get a variety of the different opinions. But if you get a chance to watch the movie, What the Health, I highly I think that's a good movie to get you motivated and maybe start making you a little curious about our food. So that's all I have to say about that. I want to thank you very much for listening to RV Talk Radio. Please be safe out there. We appreciate all the great feedback and we'll try to get our episodes out more, but we've really been swamped lately, so I apologize. But don't forget, you can always hear episodes of RV Talk Radio on Good Talk Radio. And, uh, uh, we appreciate you visiting us. So take care and we'll talk to you next time. Bye now. Hey, thanks again for listening to RV Talk Radio. Please take the time to subscribe, like, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. We'd appreciate that. Be safe and we'll talk to you next time. Bye now, guys.